Hello, everyone. Welcome to a special edition of Let's Run.com's Track Talk, our weekly podcast live from Boston. We have two men, boots on the ground, Boston 2019 Boston Marathon edition of the show. It is going to be fantastic. This is your fearless host. I listened to last week's podcast. I think Jonathan referred to me as the most entertaining and controversial man in track and field. So I'll take it. Robert Johnson here, your host, along with Jonathan Galton, Weldon Johnson in Boston. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. I wasn't really sure where to begin today. Obviously, we're going to be talking about Boston, 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 Boston. But I was thinking about starting, you know, a few weeks ago, we started with a funeral for the 5,000. I was thinking about starting for a funeral for the for the sport. If you haven't heard, folks, someone who's coached by Patrick Sane, the coach, same coach by Ali Kipchoge, has been busted for a biological passport violation. So if that group's dirty, I'm out of the sport. We're going to have some insight into that because I think you guys have talked to people. Um, the press conference is just wrapped up. I don't even know what you've heard from there. But I don't want to start with that, guys. I want to start with a two-minute – can we fire a gun off? I want to start with – boom. There we go, folks. The podcast has just begun. And then now we're going to have a two-minute of silence to imitate what's going to happen at the Boston Marathon, folks. The masses are not allowed to run with the pros anymore. So, guys, let's do two minutes of silence. Ready? Starting now. Actually, Robert, I'm elite, so I think I should be allowed to talk for these two minutes. So I'm just going to talk. Um, I had a nice plane ride down here today, talked to some elites. You guys are going to hear some of this stuff. Actually, we, may, we play, may play some audio just at the end of this with some of the elites. Now that I'm sort of a casual jogger, the big takeaway I had non-running was I talked to Ryan Hall at length on how to bulk up and look like Ryan Hall. We'll have some of those tips. You non-elite people can just keep listening here. God, two minutes is a long time. What am I supposed to talk about? We, we had some interesting conversations with Jared Ward, Shadrach B. Watt. And some insight from some of the top stars from Africa. All right, let's just get this thing going. All right, Jonathan, you now have permission as a non-elite. I think Weldon's given us both permission. So, John, you're the real journalist here, the master's in journalism. I always say the Boston Marathon Media Day is the worst marathon media day of any major I've ever been to. They put all... 40 elite athletes into one room and they give you one hour to talk to everybody. It's absolutely impossible. Other races drag it over several days or, or not drag it, highlight it over feature it over several days. John, who did you talk to? What's the biggest takeaway you got from the elite media day today? Uh, I, I talked to mostly women today, actually uh, just don't know how that happened, but that's how it sort of broke down. And I talked to two uh, of the top Americans in the women's elite yeah. field. That would be Jordan to say, and Sally Kipiego didn't talk to Des Linden. She was basically sworn by media the entire time I was here. And I talked to her on the phone last week, so I didn't feel it was totally necessary. Her agent, Josh Cox, says that she's in better shape than she was last year and that mentally she's just more relaxed. You know, this is just gravy for her, really. Because she won the Boston Marathon last year, that's a career-defining accomplishment. So talking to Sally and Jordan, I'll start with Jordan Hussey. We all remember she was third here two years ago, her marathon debut, 223 flat, fastest debut ever by an American woman. And she says that she's about in the same kind of shape this year. And I found that I was wondering, you know, her half marathon in Rome, which she ran in March, didn't go that well. She only ran 71 minutes. She was hoping to run sub 70. So I asked her to explain that. And she basically said, Look, the race didn't go as we wanted, but training's been good. She said her long runs have been better than ever. She said really the biggest difference now versus uh, the last couple of years where she ran 220 in Chicago in 2017 and 223 in Boston in 2017. The biggest difference is that her 200-meter repeats in practice are about half a second slower. She's running them in 32 seconds flat instead of 31.5. And I was joking with her. I was like... Well, that seems like a, a huge, huge difference. You know, that's really going to come back to bite her in the marathon that she's running half a second slow for 200s. But I actually found it interesting she runs 200s in practice at all. But she said that Galen and Alberto do it. They think it's important to work on form. And, you know, your 200s help your 400s, which help your 800s. It just helps you run more efficiently. So they do it a bunch. And she's been doing it a bunch as well. She said her speed maybe isn't quite where it needs to be, but her strength is good. So she's expecting a good race on Monday. And then Kip Yego, she's another interesting athlete because she hasn't raced. It's been even longer since she's raced a marathon. It's all the way back to November of 2016 in New York where she finished second ahead of Molly Huddle 
Mary Katani was the only one who beat her on that day. And Sally essentially said she gave birth to a daughter, Emma, in 2017, and it took her longer than expected to come back from that pregnancy. It was a bit frustrating. She said her body was weak at times. She would get sick more easily. It wasn't, it wasn't easy for her to recover. And she essentially said that she's feeling better now. You know, in, she ran the Houston half in January. That race didn't go that well. But she said every week since then has gone better. She's not quite where she wants to be for the trials next year. She said that's really the big goal. Her goal is to get through Boston, do all right, and then, you know, the trials is when she really expects that she'll be back close to. She said, I asked her, will you be better than, will you be as fit as you were in 2016 in New York? And she said, no, I'm going to be fitter than that. So I think Monday is going to be interesting to see how Kip Diego does, but she is very optimistic about where she can get to in the next 10 months. Folks, and if you're not familiar, Sally Kipiego, the 2012 Olympic 10,000-meter silver medalist, is now an American. She will be competing for America, trying to make the 2020 Olympic team. Uh, yeah, she only ran 72-12 in that half on January 12th, and Hase ran, what, 71-something at the Rome half? So, you know, I mean, to me, and, and I don't want to be a De you know Debbie Downer or whatever it is, but... For Hase to say that she thinks she's in the same type of shape as she was several years ago, I, I'm just not buying it. You know, this is the same woman, and, and I love Jordan because she, she's someone that we've been following since high school. So if you have someone to root for, you know, or even against, you need personalities, names. She's a brand, and, and she's definitely that. But come on, wasn't she saying last year she how she, everything was fine and, and, and she would be at the meet, and, you know, be at the race on Monday, on the Friday, and then she didn't even show up because she was hurt, right? They did an MRI between. Well, they, they did an MRI the day before the race. She was planning on racing when she spoke on Friday, though she probably didn't play up her injury as much. But that's every every elite athlete. No elite athlete's going to say, "I'm barely in shape to you know my body's falling apart. I might not even race." No one's going to say that two days before the race. I, I want to be on the record. I actually listened to last week's podcast. You know, it's it's fun to have predictions. Right now on the record, Jordan is say will, will not be contending for the win. Top five would be good for her in this race. Now the field's not that deep, so could she get top three? Maybe, but on the record, I'll say that. And guys, when I was driving around this week in my car, I actually listened to last week's podcast. I really enjoyed the Kelsey Bruce interview. Um, I've never listened to any of the long interviews, so Shelby Houlihan, sir, I haven't listened to the interview, but. Um, I enjoyed the podcast, but I enjoyed also being right, Jonathan. You guys were saying the course would be a great equalizer. John was saying that the Stella just saying that the World Mountain Champ would be a contender for the win. And I was like, no, 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 no. This course, the World Cross Country course, isn't going to change anything. So I was proven right there. And, and folks, I hopefully will be proven right again. On my, I mean, not hopefully. I mean, I guess I'd like to be wrong, I'm going to say. But I, I, I just uh, – I, I, I don't see it. I mean, I, I just – So John didn't speak to – des linden but i did and i thought it was kind of interesting so essentially the conversation with des was like hey you know defending champ does that change how you approach things here and she said you know i can be a little bit more aggressive i have nothing to lose i sort of figured i let my chance go in 2011 and i couldn't believe i got another one so i seized it last year and so this is i don't know this is like the cherry on top of the sunday but she sounds very fit ready to go training's gone well um, but then I said, hey, are there any other athletes you're worried about? Didn't mention any names. And like one of the first people she mentioned was, it's interesting to say, like they still want to be first American. She mentioned, she's like, well, you know, Jordan's got to be fit. Otherwise she wouldn't be here. And I think she sort of knows like, you know, Alberto's not going to send somebody here. They're not going to start. They may do some media stuff beforehand, but he's not going to let him on the start line unless he thinks, you know, they can, they can do something well. So the, the race, her half marathon didn't go as well as she wanted, but that didn't mean they didn't think she might run two minutes faster or whatever that was. And then sort of the other thing Des said about the field was, you know, there's really no one who sort of stands out and you're just like, Oh, this person's going to win the race. And then, you know, we do have Worknish de Geffa. I hope I'm saying that right. She ran two seventeen in Dubai. And so that's pretty quick. I mean, what's number that? Four, four, number four ever, but it's not a household name. She's never run a marathon outside of Dubai. And, so then I sort of joked to Daz. I was like, well, Dubai, you know, add three minutes to the time. And she laughed and said, hey, you said that, not me. And so I did talk to Degefa and ask her, like, you ready? And she said, yeah, training's going great. Um, worried about the hills. I mean, she speaks a little English. But she, she, some of these 
stars who English isn't the first language don't say a lot. And she's like, yeah, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. The weather or whatever, she's ready to try to tackle it. But Boston is very different than Dubai. Dubai is perfectly flat and warm weather. And here, even if it's good weather, you still have to deal with the Boston Hills and whatnot. So if you took, I don't know who you consider the top marathoner in the world, Katani, Mary Katani, put her in this field. I'm like, well, you, you still got to survive survive it. So the marathon distance, I think, used to be the great equalizer. And now I think some of these tough courses equalize the fields a bit more. And this woman's field really isn't that strong on paper. You know, if Degaffa goes on to be a huge star, it's a much stronger field. But otherwise, it's wide open for the taking, I would say. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I think it's pretty open. And the one thing I will say, just to return to Hesse for a minute, Look, before Boston in 2017 and before Chicago in 2017, they were talking a big game. They were talking some serious times. And Chicago, she said, I'm even fitter than I was in Boston, low 220s. They were talking about it. Well, she went, she ran 220 in that race. She ran 223 in Boston in her debut. When they have talked a big game, the, the Oregon Project is not generally a group that says, we really fit and then fails to back it up. Usually, if they're talking and they're excited about this stuff, look at the Yomif Kajelsha chasing the world record. When they said at the start of the season, this guy is going to be trying to run 347, break the world record, run 348. Would you have believed it? No, but they knew what kind of fitness he he was in. And so with Hesse, I think if she says she's ready to go and Alberto thinks she's ready to go, I think the big performance uh, could be coming on. Come on, guys. I haven't heard a big game. I I haven't seen Ken go with any articles. I haven't seen anything talking a big game except for y'all talk to her and she said – you know, the st- standard press conference thing that how things she were going runners world that she thinks she's in a good, as good a shape as she was before Boston two years ago. Oh, okay. She, she told me her long runs have been better than ever. I think she's, she's not talking like she's going to go out and break the course record, but she's talking whoa. that she's going to be in the mix for the win. Whoa, 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 whoa. Revisionist history, folks. I was going to say before Boston, when she ran that two twenty three, she ran a 67, 55 half folks this year. She just ran what? 71. Yep. Now, so I was going to write her off for sure, but this scares me. Do you know what she ran three weeks before she ran 220.57 in Chicago? Well, it was a slow race in either New Haven or Philadelphia or something. Philadelphia, she ran 70.42. How is that possible? It was humid, and that was the main reason I think she said it was humid. But she lost by four minutes in that race. Yeah, because the winner ran 66 minutes on a humid day. Excuse me, two minutes, two minutes, 68. So anyways, I, I guess it's possible, but folks... It's not wide open. Uh, I'm gonna, you guys aren't, you know, you're close to the elites down there. You're a little biased because you're talking to them. We've got two potential winners here. And let me pull up my. <laughs> I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> yeah. Worknish the Geffa, I mean, 217.41. Well, did you ask her? It's really interesting. She's only run Dubai, I think, the last three years. Why didn't she do a second marathon? She had some injury problems or something. Do we have any idea? No, I tried to ask her and didn't really get a good answer. Anyways, come on. Fourth fastest winner of. First fast, fourth fastest women ever. She could blow this field away and win it. And if you look at the field, I mean, there's only five women under 221. And Nick Hippogat, though, is close to 40. She's 39. She did run 221 in the fall, so I wouldn't rule her out. But um, Wait, I thought you said only two people could win this, Robert. Should Wel- Weldon, do you want to tell everyone no. else in the race that they don't need to run it, or should I? No. Yes, I want to. Look. We at Let's Run are famous for downplaying people and telling them they can't win. Mary DeBaba hasn't done anything in years, so let's ignore her. But Meskaram Asefa of Ethiopia, she ran 220.36 in Franklin, Frankfurt in, in the fall. She's run four marathon wins in the last two years, including Nagoya and Frankfurt in her last two. So you've got two women there that, that are, are better than Hase. And, you know, I, I, but it, okay. Now, if those two don't will do well and Ed is 39, then it's wide open. And I'm going to say this. And hopefully Desi's not listening to this. But folks, do we do we put like an asterisk next to get Desi's win? And do we put one even Yuki's too? I mean, imagine if I told you t- to me the winner of last year's Boston Marathon, if this is me being jaded Robert and everyone's, you know, whatever, um, was the weather. I mean, if I told you the winning time was two thirty nine and only one woman would break two forty four, would you even really care who won it? What was the men's time? Yeah, I care who wins. It's still a race. If some obscure African won the race, and if it wasn't somebody like Yuki Koichi, the people's champ, won that race, would we be talking about them as like, oh, yeah, um, uh, Benson uh, Kipsang uh, uh, won the race last year. Oh, yeah, it's a career-defining thing. So he he just talking about house money. We probably wouldn't even mention his name. You may put an asterisk by it, but she'll put an exclamation mark. Ooh, good point. Thank you. 
And as I, I said, hey, what's the coolest thing of winning Boston in the last year? I go, what's the best part of being the Boston champ? She kind of thought about it, and then she had a good answer. She said, forever now, I'm like synonymous with the Boston Marathon. I'll always be part of this community. And I think if, she, you know, if, sure, she'd been second in 2011, but if you have a near miss, six years from now, people aren't inviting you here. You're, you're not coming back as a champion. So say what you want about it, but forever she's the Boston marathon champion. That's a good point. And thank you. You know, I mean, I, I think that I only sort of brought that up the asterisk part because in general, and, and this is my, me sort of being a reader of sports gene by David Epstein. And I know there's some people who read the message board who think, Oh no, all the Kenyans are on drugs. Guys, Americans have taken drugs. Martin Fagan's Irish people have taken drugs. And Martin Fagan was an EPO. They weren't running 203 and 204. So I generally think, particularly in the marathon, that an American, okay, I don't want to say American born because, I mean, Kieran Eshtababa's baby was born in America. So someone who's grand, someone who does not have a family member that was born in East Africa before 1960, um, will not be originally winning these mar- world marathon majors unless the unless those people, the East Africans, blow up and run terribly like they did last year in Boston. Now, Boston's not that deep, so we've already gone through the people. Galen Rupp won the 2017 Chicago Marathon. Did he not? Galen Rupp won the 2017 Chicago Marathon. No, I, we're, we're, this is Galen Rupp's in his own category. Why? Because he's so good. Okay, but I think, <laughs> one, it's about opportunity. Maybe my category should be if you're not coached by by Alberto. Yeah, how you, how are you? Shalane Flanagan it, won the 2017 New York City Marathon. I'm mainly talking. Okay, I'm mainly thinking men, but not named Rupp. But okay. Anyways, I, I'm off my game today, guys. I apologize. All right. Well, that was a good podcast. We'll be wrapping up. I got to catch the train out of here. <laughs> okay. Any other insights from the elite women? I think we started with the women because Boston starts the with the women, but folks. You know, most people are into this men's race. People don't want to admit it, but they are. It's not PC to say. So should we move on to the men's race? I mean, the men's race is, is stronger. Uh, I talked to Ryan Hall briefly. I didn't get to speak to Sarah, but he said her training's gone very well. I think people sort of knew that fitter than she's ever been. Um, kind of interesting thing. <laughs> you know, Sarah Hall's PR is a minute and a half faster than Sally Kipiego's in the marathon. Yeah, but Sally ran that to get second in New York. That's true. But I think that shows also on these tough courses, Boston and New York are different. And that's some of the beauty of them is, I mean, you can run fast. Actually, you can run fast in both these places, right? We saw it last year in New York. We've seen it here in Boston. and But also sometimes it's very slow here in New York and Boston. So, you know, the people are kind of known by their PR in the marathon, but place – is what's most important. You talk to all the athletes here, especially a lot of the Americans who will automatically qualify for the, get an Olympic qualifying time. If they finish in the top 10, they're focused on place. They're not focused on time, especially because you don't know what the weather is going to be like here. I don't know, John, you spoke to Mary Wasera. Did you, we mention anything about that? No, I, I did talk to her and she's making a marathon debut, which is pretty interesting because very few people make the marathon debuts in Boston. No woman has ever won since 1972 when they began the official women's race. No one's ever won Boston in their debut on the women's side. And no one's ever won a world marathon major since 2013, since Tokyo is in, it became part of the majors. No one's ever won a major in their debut. Uh, she's a very good half marathoner, though. She's run 66-29. She's medaled at the World Half Champs twice. So she's a good prospect, and... She said essentially that she has run the BA half marathon a few times and had success here. And she's run some tough courses. She's, she said, why not? Boston is a tough course. She acknowledges that, but she thinks she's ready to go to the marathon now. She's been doing the half marathon for a long time. She's run on tough courses before, so why not try Boston? So that is what she, that's the approach she's going in with. Does it mean she's going to be good enough to win? I think it's unlikely because, again, it's hard to master this course in your marathon debut, but she is very talented. Yeah, she's, I, I want to add her to my list as another potential winner. I definitely think she could do it. It is interesting. She's 30, hasn't run the marathon up until 30. So, it's, you know, I guess I guess Edna Kiplica didn't really move to the marathon late in her life. You think if you were going to be good at it, you would have moved there earlier. I guess same thing could be said for Elliot Kipchoge. You know, you think in practice you'd realize you're really good at the long stuff. 
Um, but you know, she was second in the New York City half in March, so so she's had some good prep races. Um, definitely, uh, you know, an, an interesting contender there. Something I would tell if I was coaching Mary, or really even Jeffrey Karui on the men's side, I, I think that I would just say run with the lead pack. There is no reason to take the lead at all until you're th- way through the Newton Hills. I mean, I would wait until like mile. 25 to take you know after you hit the 24 mile mark then consider taking lead there's no reason to bust out particularly if it's raining or something and and, and destroy people i mean if you're feeling good just stay with the pack and hold back and hold back and hold back and then go so you don't misjudge things um you know i think that's the safest way to 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 do it um well if you're a stud maybe i mean if you're someone who needs something to go right look at meb winning in 2014 yuki winning lost year I mean, I guess Jeffrey, you could say Jeffrey Karui went too early last year because of conditions. I, I tend to throw last year's race out a little bit as an anomaly anyway. But I think if you're an underdog, maybe an unconventional strategy is what you need. If you're a total stud, yes, just hang with the leaders and then kick when you're ready. Okay, guys, that's good for the women. Weldon's got to catch the train, so let's move to the men's race. And what a field. I mean, we're sort of – a lot of the women have – question marks whether it's just they're coming off a recent marathon or they haven't run a good marathon in a while but the men i mean you've got yuku kawaguchi the defending champion what a great story you've got dathan ritzenheim a 207 guy trying to get back to his old glory but we've ranked them as the 15th and 14th most likely people to win this race we've almost given them basically quote unquote no shot if you haven't read our preview we, we have 16 contenders for the for the win 16 people who could theoretically based on our stats win this race which is incredible but then we have seven studs i, I guess one of those guys dropped out germany gribble celeste has dropped out so that's down to 15 but then they added in zerson today so i guess we're back to 16 but we have seven genuine contenders kenneth kip uh, of kenya 205 44 lemmy burhanu of ethiopia 204 33 solman dexisa of ethiopia 204 40 Sisa LeMay, 20408. I mean, he's one of the 19th fastest man in history. Lawrence Chirono, 20406. Jeffrey Karui, former Boston champion, 20627 PB. And then Lalisa DeSisa, the defending champion. I mean, she's not the defending champion, but multiple Boston time champion, 20445. So a ton of 204 guys. Um, I mean, we we list, we name those big three as the last three as the total studs. How, how do you break this race down? Was there any insight that you gained? I mean, it's really hard. Again, most people are going to say they're in good shape if they're here. But, well, then, what do you feel about this? John said he mainly talked to women. So did you talk to any of the men today? Yeah, I talked to DeCisa and uh, Jeffrey Curry. So we had DeCisa ranked as our number one favorite. I said, hey, you know, you won New York last year in, what, 205 something? How do you compare to that? He's like, I'm in better shape. How does this compare to your other wins? I'm in better shape. And I think, you know, maybe some people just sort of throw that out there, but I kept, you know, asking him about the training and everything I got was, you know, very positive. He's ready to go. He knows how to run this course. He's what, one here twice? He's also, he was second in 2016 as well. I mean, the guy doesn't run very many bad marathons. If he does, it seems like he drops out. So, and he, so if he's fit, the other thing, you know, some guys come in here fit and they don't know how to run the course. Well, he's an expert at this course. So all signs are positive for Lolita de Sisa. Um, and then Jeffrey sort of, the only thing last year, I mean, he was on his way last year to like running away with this thing. He had been two-time defending champion and the world champion. He would have had the argument like, hey, is this guy better than Kipchoge? I think most people still would have said no, but you, that's, I mean, when you've won your last, what, three marathons and they're all majors, what else can you say about a guy? Instead, the weather gets to him. He's wearing that wind sail jacket, Nike. You know, they sometimes make some mistakes <laughs> with their apparel, <laughs> like Kipchoge running the, with the shoe and sole out. But um, the wind sail jacket, I think, did a man, but I don't know. John John asked him this year about the jacket and what, tell him what they said. Yeah, he said... Essentially, he said that you need to wear a jacket if it's that wet and cold. He told me, like, it's raining. You need a jacket like that. I asked him if he would wear it again. And he said if it was bad conditions again, he would definitely consider wearing it again because to him, the benefits outweighed the drawbacks of the, the wind sail thing. And he knew it looked kind of silly. But he, he said the big mistake he made last year was not the jacket, but going too early. He made that hard push up the hills and he just 
was totally spent. He ran the last mile in 718. And if he doesn't do that, I mean, if he just runs normally and then maybe waits until 24 or 25 miles to go, maybe he wins that race. So he said the one thing he learned from last year was patience. He's not going to be making any reckless moves. I think he's going to be running like Robert said, wait, 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 and then kick when you're ready. And maybe he goes on the hills again this time because the conditions aren't going to be as bad. But if they are bad, I would see him employing a patient race plan. Yeah, I think we're with him. I mean, he's shown how to run this course. The has shown how to run this course. If these two guys could become like household names in Boston. And I don't know, maybe like the duel in the sun back in the day, you could have some epic battles here. And I think if these guys were what, I mean, American, essentially people would be just talking about, Oh, this epic battle in Boston that you're about to have. And sort of the, I guess with Curry, the one sort of chink in the armor, are we allowed to say that phrase anymore? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, is, after dropping out of here, he was only six in Chicago in 206. You know, 206, American guy does cartwheels for a Kenyan world champion in Chicago to get six. It's pretty bad performance. And I said, what was the deal there? And he's like, I, I just wasn't fit. And he says he's fit for this one, ready to go. He said the focus, though, this year is the world championships in Doha, which was interesting to me. He's like, oh, that's the focus. So... I was like, that one's hot at night. He's like, oh, it'll be fun. Run at night. I think they'll light the roads. You know, <laughs> like, hey, dumbass, they're going to light the roads. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm looking forward to that race as well because I was looking forward to World Cross Country and I think a midnight marathon in Doha. You're looking forward to the midnight marathon? I could not d- disagree more. That race is going to be over at 2, 2.30 in the morning and then we're going to have to write about it, Weldon? That is not going to be fun. Hey, I already don't get sleep and eat the World Championships. Oh, the stuff fair. we do. We'll be, we'll be pay-per-view by then, though, for sure, for the podcast. At 3 a.m., bonus coverage. I'll put a live video of watching John and I recap that race. 3 a.m. Doha is probably good for uh, U.S. primetime. Yeah. They're doing this for American TV, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think the night marathon is awesome. Just put, just put a link to the results. What do people need to know? We can write about it in the morning. Lawrence Toronto sitting there, and I see his little bib, and I'm like, what, what, what's this guy done? He's a stud well then. 20406. Uh, oh, sorry, I, didn't, I wasn't able to speak to him. Were you able to speak to him, John? I, I didn't get to talk to him, but he is an absolute stud. He set the course record in the Honolulu Marathon in 2017. He crushed it. He set the course record the last two years in Amsterdam, 20509 in 2017, and then 20406 last year. Oh, he also set the course record in Honolulu again. He set it in 2016 and 2017. And those are two marathons where if you're winning those races – there's a good chance you're going to be contending for major titles. This guy is a total stud. He's run one major, which was last year in London. He ran seventh because he ran a big positive split. He went out you know, chasing world record pace with the, the lead pack and just fell off. But the rest of his marathon resume is just absolutely spectacular. So I didn't get to talk to him, but I think he's definitely a serious contender for the win. I mean, he's amazing. I mean, again, well, right. I think the, if you're a fan, think about this. Imagine if we were describing an American like this. You know, Meb Kofledsky or Ryan Hall or this guy, not only that, in those eight races, in his last eight marathons, he's finished first or second in seven of them, which is really remarkable. And the London, the hiccup, I mean, yeah, first of all, it's London. So I would argue that like third in London is like a win in almost any other major. Well, he was seventh there, though. And, and, but he, yeah, 207 flat doesn't sound good, but when you go out in 60, whatever they did, I mean, he ran 209, 25, Robert. Just getting the facts straight here. <sighs> Gosh, I'm trying to hype up the race. Boston has hired me. As a, yeah. This is John. This is 20, 20, 2019. The president has said facts don't really matter. I think or wasn't it the information officer or something? Well, he's essentially alternative, fa- that, alternative know, facts by his no. words and deeds every single week of the year. But go on. Well, it's just Sean Spicer. Alternative, alternative facts. Alternative, facts, correct, yes. alternative facts, John. Alternative facts. I'm factually wrong, but I was emotionally correct. But let's talk a little about the weather. I've got it pulled up. Newton Mass, weather.com. I, I don't have the hour by hour. I don't know if it's out yet. I think that only goes like, doesn't quite go 72 hours. But the weather looks like it will be raining at, at the start. My forecast is showing 60, high of 66, low of 43. It's up to 66? It was in the 40s earlier this week. It's crazy. Yeah. But, you know, in the morning, it'll probably be like 50. So the, the temperature would probably be in the high 40s, the early low 50s for the race, which is good. Rain, which would not be good, but this is showing a tailwind, a south-southwest wind, 10 to 20 miles per hour. So that's not 
that cold, you know, I, I think that those weathers will, will be fine. Um, and one thing, you know, when we were talking about the jacket for Karui. I don't, I think when he doesn't win, we blame the jacket. Maybe the jacket was helping him. I always thought that I would, I would wear, if I could run the race again, like if I was in the race and you put me in last year's race, I would say wear a waterproof jacket so you don't get wet. A e jacket world. would help him, but a jacket in which all the sleeves are billowing out like a wind sail, I don't think necessarily helps you. And you that want a jacket water- wasn't waterproof. Yeah. What about wearing? What jacket. about wearing that wind sail this year? This is the next Alberto Salazar gimmick. Oh, you wear a kite with the tailwind. Kite. Yeah. yeah. He could. What if he? Fl- Jordan might have a kite on her head. Would you be disqualified if you were if the wind picked you up like kind of like race walking like? If you go, if you fly too far, like yeah, how I'm many trying feet? to think. Set the long jump world record in the on routes, the Boston Marathon title. Have these, well, you know, you start wearing webbed shoes or webbed things between your legs to take advantage of the wind. I'm sure Salazar's already thought thought about that. Uh, guys, I'm disappointed that my boots were not on the ground in Boston this morning, but because normally when I go there, I have I, I literally I, I would have written down all seven t- top contenders and try to get at least some sentence out of all seven. I'm always waiting for the nugget of wisdom. Like some guys saying like, I don't know, I guess they always say they're in shape, but anyone talk to Kip Kamoy, Burhanu, Dakisa or Lima? I'm sorry. Sir. I'm a no on all of those. I'm afraid you know how it we, is, Robert. There's 40 people in the room. You, you can't talk to all of them. Can we wait and, for David Monty to write his article? Yeah, David, please. Um, we should have spoken to the three studs. I apologize for not speaking to Lawrence Chirono. But in speak, speaking of weather apps, there's only one weather app you should use. It's Dark Sky. Don't download it now. We'll make them a sponsor of the podcast, and you'll download, and we'll get a cut of it. So wait till download. But we should have a sponsor of the podcast. Today's podcast is sponsored by Health IQ. Eric, our web guy, is going to save over $19,000 on his health insurance because of Health IQ. Like, same plan, same, you know, coverage. And he went and got tested at health IQ cause he runs and they're like, yeah, you will pay over 30 years, $19,000 less than what he was currently paying. Let's run.com slash health IQ for more info. Rojo's even checking it out. Yeah. Next Wednesday folks is my big blood test. A little worried. I've been trying to eat healthier and now I have. Yes. So those of you who actually care about your family, go to let's run.com slash health IQ for more info. And so dark sky will be our weather app, but Dark Sky is showing, so everyone was talking about the weather, and originally, you know, the sensationalist stories that we're having, that it was going to be equivalent to last year's weather. First of all, that's impossible. That's the worst weather I've ever seen in my life as an adult, I think, like, outside of the Arctic. Can, can I interrupt? This is an unsponsored play. You know, like, like Eric the Love Guy just happened to use Health IQ, had nothing to do with us, and then we put them on the website because we, we knew they were a sponsor of us. Same thing with with this weather app that Walden's told me about Dark Sky. I paid for it last week, and Walden and I were in the same town, and he told me about it. It's amazing. Oh, my God. I've clicked on Newton Mass, and I'm getting hourly weather for, for Monday. But how accurate? It, well, we hopefully it's accurate, right? When you're walking your dog, this thing is damn accurate. John, what time is the race starting? 10 o'clock? 10 a, 9.30 for the women. Yeah, 9.30 for the women. So 10 a.m. For the, for the men, it's 62 degrees. 67 at, at 12 p.m. So that's you know, a little bit warmer than you would like, but with the rain, I kind of think I would rather have it be warm than cold. Uh, there's nothing worse than running in cold rain. No, it doesn't list the wind. Does it? Well then yeah, it does slide to the right. Robert, this thing has it all slide to the right. Yes. High quality podcasting here. I'm sure everyone's riveted in their seats. Everyone slide your app to the right. This is what you want to do. Build the visual picture, John, as you slide your app to the right. Right. I can't slide to the right. Anyway, um, I can pull it up here for you, but it was sort of interesting because I'm talking to Shadrach Biwad and Jared Ward, who are one of them likely will, well, I guess Scott Fobble. Scott Fobble's right in there with the chance. Those three, I'd say, are the best, most likely guys to be the first American. Correct. And then you've got Ritzenheim, who's a oh. wild card, I would say. Yeah. Oops. Sorry, Dathan. No, we purposely did not talk to Dathan. We wrote an article pre-race, and I was a little offended. You guys said, like, he has zero chance of winning. And the last guy we said had zero chance of winning was Meb Kofleski, and he won this damn thing. So that's not true. You said that he has a w- between one in twenty and one in nineteen thousand chance of winning. So not zero. One in twenty. I think that was the lowest odds oh, that Robert. That's pretty good. That's well, 5%. It, between one in twenty and one in nineteen thousand. So, so, you know, not, not zero. There's a chance, and we whipped open Dark Sky because 
I don't know, the horror stories. It's like you go to the Olympics, there's going to be an Ebola breakout, rioting, this sort of stuff. Boston, it's always about the weather. So somehow people were claiming the weather was going to be as bad as last year. And then we pulled it up and, you know, you see 62 degrees at the start and a tailwind. And Robert, what do you want to know? The wind. Oh, oh yeah, the wind. So right now, this is at the finish. I'm just doing Boston Marathon. 10 a.m., 12 mile an hour winds out of the north. I mean, going north. Uh, 12 p.m., northeast wind, which is straight tailwind, 12, 15 miles an hour. I mean, that's pretty good. So I tell this to Shadrach and Jared. Out and of the northeast? Or blowing, blowing to the, to to the, the northeast. northeast. Okay, that is a tailwind. Yeah. So, and they get all excited. And then Jared, being the statistician that he is, starts complaining that it'll be too hot and humid. <laughs> He goes, tailwind 67? Oh my gosh, it's too hot. So well, those are similar conditions. 60s and humid was exactly what he was running in in Rio when he got the sixth place at the Olympics. So, But that was so much hotter. I mean, the sun's out. I don't know. It was pretty muggy. I don't think it was sunny that day. It was, it was 70. There's no way this weather tomorrow is equivalent to Rio in the summer. Isn't it interesting? Like you get sixth in the Olympics. And it's like People pay a lot of attention to sixth in the Olympics, but like sixth in Boston is not as much. I mean, I'm reading the American article that, that that we wrote about the American men's prospects, or John wrote, I guess I should say, and I'm I'm kind of shocked here. First of all, guys, how about a shout out to Brooks Hansen's Cedric Beaulieu? He's been third and fourth the last two years in Boston. But we have a poll at the bottom of the article, and uh, can someone explain this to me? Scott Fobble is the top pick. Thirty three percent of Lutz runners are picking him to be the top American, just ahead of Jared Ward, thirty two. I mean, Ward beat Fobble in New York. Correct me by wrong. by four seconds. Yeah, but he did that on a limited build-up. True. And he's got a better pedigree. Yeah, if I had to bet on someone to be the top American, I would bet Jared Ward for the reasons outlined in our article. But I mean, B-Watt's being disrespected behind Ritz and I mean, he's fourth pick. I mean, I, I no offense to Fobble, but I, I would – well, top American. It's tough. Everything I've heard about Scott is he's very fit. Yeah, I would probably put Rich's odds higher. I, I think it's more likely that Fobble runs a, a solid race and is maybe the second American. But if you put top American, I would might even put Ritz ahead of Fobble. I mean, I think his talent level is just a lot higher. So I don't know. That poll is confusing to me. I I would if I had to pick between Ritz and Fobble, who's going to finish higher and who has the better chance of being top American, I'd say Fobble because I think Fobble is. I think Ward is probably slightly better right now, but we don't know 100%. That's what the race is going to determine. But Ritz, we, we just don't know anything about how he is as a marathoner right now. It's been four years since he ran a marathon. I think his risk of bombing or having some problem is a lot higher than it is for Scott Fobel. It is If we were taking 2012 Dathan Ritzenhain or 2013 Dathan Ritzenhain in this race, I would go with him. But this is 2019 Dathan Ritzenhain. He could certainly be the top American, but I just think his chances of something going wrong are, are higher than the chances of Scott not being the top. I think Scott has a better chance to be the top American. He's also more likely to produce a good race. I, I think good race and top American are, are not necessarily the same thing. I mean, guys, John, Ritzenheim, this is why I'm bullish on him. I know he only did an eight-week buildup, but he ran a 61-24 on February 10th before the eight weeks even started. That's better than what Fobble can run in his entire life if he trained for it. Do you know what Scott Fobble's half marathon PR is? It's in the 62-minute range. Yeah, 6208. So Ritz began eight weeks ago ahead of in the fitness. All he's got to do is get the distance down. So uh, I mean Scott ran did, did Scott he won well, he ran the Gasparilla half. I mean, he won it in like 6509. It wasn't there. I don't think you know the time wasn't super important. I've just heard that his his training has been very, very good. He was only four seconds behind Jared Ward last. Oh, he did run. He did really get six at USA Cross too. No, that's interesting. I, I see that. He's been running well. Yeah, he's the fittest he's ever been. And they, his coach and agent both say he was born to run this Boston course. They say that he's really – it's suited for him. He's It's his kind of course. So I, I'm bullish on his prospects. Again, folks, we're coming back to the Let's Run.com Robert Johnson mantra. I'm, uh, my biases are coming out. A few years ago when I got jaded about the sport, I said we should only let top 10 foot locker kids be pros. That's why I'm bullish on Ritz. Also, I wrote a article about how Ritz would be the first white dude under 27 minutes when he made his 10,000 meter debut about 15 years ago. So, Wasn't was Scott Fogel? Like, Scott Fogel was a foot locker finalist, was he not? Well, I don't know if he was. I'm pretty Robert sure. said top 10 at foot locker finals, didn't you? Yeah. Because now it's watered down. I mean, now they take 40 and... I got to look up his results. So, 
any did you talk to well first of all were you guys even allowed in, in, i mean there was any pushback if you haven't read that we've written an editorial folks ripping boston scott fobel 17th by the way 2009 foot locker finals oh so he's a talent, he's a talent. so we ripped boston for their two minute head start now any pushback in that guys any any comments from agents or amateurs in the in the fairmont copley hotel that you're at? one photographer agreed with me he said that he thought we had it right and the only thing that we that was kind of weird different from normal is after the press conference concluded they said anyone from let's run.com has to stay in here for two minutes and then you can go and interview everyone else so that was a little unorthodox but we, we managed to run them down yeah i I, mean, I think a lot of the pros don't even know about this i asked uh shadrach and jared about it shadrach's like oh well maybe this is good. Like people won't be trampling us. You know, when we start, they can run up on us. And, but that's not the reason they did it. Right. So I was like, okay. And then Jared's like, wait, no, this is bad. Like we won't have the guy like, you know, in the power bar Jersey taking the lead of the Boston marathon and Randall 2012. And Jared thinks that's kind of cool. And uh, I think the universe of essentially the let's run position is the beauty of our sport. Some of the beauty of our sport is it's universality and we're all one and the gun goes off. And also as a kid, like you're at the starting line at the local road race and you see that like local, well, I guess pro isn't the word, <laughs> the local weekend warrior who wins everything. You think, wow, that guy's cool. I get to race, run next to him for a bit or at least see him on the start line. And now if you're a 225 guy, what do you have to look up to? You're a 219 guy hoping to make the marathon trials and you can't even start with them. You have to wait two minutes and run your own race. I mean, one, I'd be pissed if I entered this race thinking I would get to run some with people better than me. And now I'm, uh, I'm two nineteen and I'm the best guy in, in the second wave. I'm very upset. I paid a decent amount of money to run this race. I don't know if those guys are getting complimentary entries, but the beauty of our sport is that we all compete. The gun goes off. Sure. We have waves and stuff, but we go off as one and it's in, part of the inspiring thing. We're trying to inspire kids. We're trying to inspire people. And uh, there's no reason to separate the masses. And people are trying to claim it, it was sexist or whatnot. We can put more women in the elite field. But essentially, if you have a separate woman start, at some point, there's going to have to be a line. Or how many people can be in there? I'm fine. Put 200 women in there if you want to. But then everyone else can run the one race. And we're all one in that race. So thankfully, other races don't copy this. I don't know of any other race that starts the elite's this far in front, you know, sometimes maybe there's a buffer zone or something like that. So people don't get trampled, but trampled, but that's it. I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's absurd. I mean, it's ironic that Boston, which, which is a race that didn't offer resisted prize money because they wanted it, this to be the people's race, you know, back in the eighties is now separating the elites from everybody else. It's absolutely absurd. And, and you know, Shadrach's worried about them get, getting trampled, which isn't the excuse that really the Boston gave us, but they have now put more elites into the elite field. So there's like, you know, I think a total of 70 between the sexes, but you could still do that and have the mass start with the men, just rope them off and start, you know, the, the, the 10,000 people, you know, like five seconds behind them. So there is, you know, ample space at the start. It's totally absurd. I mean, two wrongs don't make a right. And it's like somebody got some social justice warrior got mad because of last year and, and, and in the women's race. And so they're now going to, punish the men it doesn't make any sense to me it's like saying you know it would be like okay men can't give birth that's not fair so therefore we won't let women give birth either no that doesn't help men but by 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 by, by outlawing women giving birth it hurts everybody so this isn't helping women this is just hurting men the the, the 219 marathon are in the men's field so it's just absurd and, and it really shows you sort of where our society is now you can't offend anybody instead so you know, and, and actually what they're doing is like almost offending everybody. A few, a few people can be offended with anything. I saw so, most people have been very supportive of this and sort of get, get this, what, what we're about. Supportive of what? Supportive of us, you know, sorry, supportive of our article saying there's no reason for this two minute thing. Don't, don't read that to Aaron Trout or Warren Fleshman. Okay. Have they read their article first of all? But I saw one comment on, on Facebook and I guess I could pull this up and she was saying, you know, this is sexist. And I was like, how is it sexist? She's like, where was the outrage last year when the sub elite women were separated from the elite women? Uh, we're all, I'm all for expanding the elite women, sub elite women to 200 people. Whoever wants to get there, you know, may, maybe you don't get your own water bottles and stuff. But if you want to, if 200 women want to go off at the same time, who cares? Right. But if, if, if I'm the 150th woman, I'd rather run in the men's in the open race because I'd rather run with men. Otherwise, I may have no one to run with. 
And that's one thing that's not talked about. Some of those women last year totally benefited by having, especially in those conditions, by having people to draft off of and that sort of stuff. They may not have been top 10, but if, if that were to happen again. Yeah. Did you tell this woman where was the outrage? Did you tell her you don't walk around the street looking for outrage, looking to be a victim 24-7? Robert, come, Robert, like that's the problem with Twitter and whatnot. The New York Times had a great article this week pointing out on on Twitter, essentially in Twitter, it was looking at liberal Twitter, but the comments voiced by Democrats on Twitter are not representative. They're way to the left. And I'm assuming actually if you did the study on the right, it would be the same thing. The most outraged people left or right are the ones who bother to post and comment, whereas there's like a silent majority in the middle. And so they're there was a you know freak circumstance last year where people who didn't start in the elite field finished in the top 15. The simple solution is to pay them the money they want. If you don't want that to happen again, then you expand the elite fields for the women. And the only reason we're having an elite field for women is so that, because we want to highlight their race, so they need to start before the men. Otherwise, there's one simple solution. Have the gun go off and everybody runs at the same time, and then the women's race doesn't get the, the coverage that some feel that it right. rightly deserves when it's going first. Other races like Chicago... The gun goes off and everybody goes at the same time in Chicago. So th- there isn't one way to do this. But until now, there's never been a race that separated the elite men from the rest of the masses. It's just sad. And Boston uh, Boston has, has always been the people's Olympics. It's like the one thing the guy sort of dreamed of. You know, you're a 230 guy. You can go dream of whatever at Boston. And, and you're, you're the guy who disqualifies. And so everyone's aiming at the people above them. Well, now, if you're a 220 guy, sorry. You're in a separate race. And also, I think down the road, if you're trying to qualify for Olympic trials, why would you come to Boston? I don't see the point. I mean, a lot more guys are going to CIM and that sort of stuff because of the course. Boston's never been about qual- trying to qualify for the Olympic trials here, though. That's never why. Uh, well, we've had a lot. I guess in, in you this- can get a trials qualifier, but it's right. not why they run it. But here. I think in the past, some guys will come here. It is Boston, right? It had the mystique. And let's say you're a 220 guy, and you, it might be in your, you're like, hey, there's going to be some guys to run with. But now it's like, it's like going, this is like now for a sub elite guy, it's like going to a race, a 222 marathon. And a lot of those guys are trying to qualify the trials. So that's not the race you want to go to. You want to go to like a, there's going to be guys in front of you yeah, and you and can get dragged along. Think about the moments as well. So there was a great moment, the 2013 New York city marathon with Michael Cassidy finishing with uh, Meb Kofleski. Meb had an off day. Mike ran, I think about to his ability. I'm not entirely, I don't know if Mike would have had the credentials to start with the elite start in Boston, but a moment like that is possible because you can run down some of these top people and even beat them if you start just a little bit behind them. And that's a big motivation to some of these 219 guys or 220 guys is, hey, I could get a PC alert here, scalp, uh, if I run really well and someone has a rough day. Or you can get that moment with them at the finish line. And that the chances of that happening are now lower because of the way this start has been changed. One thing we, you know, we, people are saying, you know, like, oh, these things are sexist. People forget history. This happened in Chicago in 2008, but the person who didn't get paid initially was a man, Wesley Career. For some reason then, in 2008 Chicago, they had the elite start five minutes before the mass start. Wesley started in the mass start. He was an unknown marathoner. He ran the fourth fastest time of the day. And you know this is before he ended up winning the Boston Marathon a few years later. So, guys, this happens, guys and gals, this happens all the time. It does not happen all the time, Robert. Well, it happens. And it's, no, but it's interesting, Robert. Uh, I've completely forgot about Chicago. So for whatever reason, Chicago did separate them that year, and then they've decided, wait, this is stupid. The gun goes off. We want everyone in there, whether they're invited or, or not, to get a chance to compete. Then races that have a separate women's pro women start need to decide what to do. And I think the solution really would be just to expand the women's elite start, and then have the the one go gun go off for everybody else. But for some reason. Boston decided two wrongs make a right. And hey, you know, it's good. None of these races are perfect. This doesn't mean that anything's wrong with the people at the Boston Marathon. They put on a fabulous event, but we all make mistakes, and hopefully this one's corrected next year. Or I really doubt it'll be corrected by t- tomorrow. And people need to voice their displeasure, right? Like th- that's why the media exists. I mean, it's not why the media exists, but like we want to hold people accountable, express our opinions. And, you know, someone did come up to me and say, like, hey, I, I like your stance. Of course, some people are going to agree with what Boston's doing. But I think the vast majority, the Let's Run lifer is the guy hoping to make the trials, right? That, that's the genesis. That's why Let's Run came about because 
I, I guess I had made the Olympic trials, but I quit my job to train for the trials, just hoping to be a little bit better. And there's a lot of guys who just trained to make the trials. And if you're one of those guys, what's the worst thing? What, what What's the worst thing about sort of being a non-pro elite or even some of these pro elites? It's being rejected from races, not getting into fields, not getting the opportunity to run. Now, now essentially that's what Boston's saying. You're not good enough. You can't run with the other guys. Yeah, and they just it's because they want to be fair. They want to say, oh, we're treating the men and the women the same. And that's just, you can't treat men and the women the same. Right. I mean, they're not treating them the same because the women get a highlighted start. So why don't we have a highlighted start for the elite men before the elite women? I mean, like, you could do it that way. I mean, like, well, they all treat e- the same. Equal, they get, they, the equal, men get their own start. No, the men, well, now they do by two minutes. But yeah, like, but the women's race is going on. The, the men are only running for about 10 minutes when the women aren't race isn't going on. The women get almost 30 minutes of uninterrupted TV coverage. I mean, if you're looking for a victim, or- I demand that the men get a 30 minute head start. I mean, you don't have to treat when you have divisions by sex and you're having two competitions at once, you can't treat them exactly the same. It's not possible. Like the women are starting 30 minutes before the men. So it's not possible to have the men start 30 minutes before the women. Like there have to be slightly differences, make what equitable, which it easily could be done. We don't need to harp on this anymore. Okay. Do we need to make predictions? Walden has a train to catch. We need predictions. Do you guys want audio on the weather? Um, we need one audio clip, maybe at the end after post-production, I'll throw in some of these audio clips. Do you guys want to hear weather talk from Scott, f- from Shadrach and Jared, or do you want to hear Scott Fobble talk about his goals of being top five? Since I badmouth Fobble, let's hear from Fobble, but we got to make the picks. Women's race. This is an easy one for me. Going out on a limb. Worknish to Geffa is your winner. 217 in Dubai. Victory there and a victory. Top American, Robert. I want winner and top American for men and women. Oh, top American. Do, 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 do. Did Desi run a half or anything? Do, 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 do. She ran New York City half marathon. See, if we had a really pro podcast right now, you'd have like the music in the background. So you guys are thinking. I mean, I guess I could post produce, put this in here. I was rude. Uh, I say it's so talented. I mean, it was kind of bashing her. Dream. Jordan? I think, Lind- I think Lyndon's kind of past her prime. She was past her prime two years ago, and she won this damn thing. I'm going out on a limb. Sally Kipiego. That is going out on a limb, because you said you were going out on a limb with your women's winner pick, and you picked the woman who's run 217 and is like two minutes faster than everyone else. So that's really not going out on a limb. Kipiego is going out on a limb. I disagree with you, though. I think it's Jordan Hesse is top American, and I think Meskarem Asefa of Ethiopia is going to be my pick for the win. The reason being that she has been in very good form in recent years. She won in Frankfurt in the full. She won in Nagoya last year. She ran 221 and 220 in those two races. That's very impressive. And in 2017, she won Houston and she won Rotterdam. So that's four wins in the last two years. She's run one major before, but that was back in 2015 before she got to this level. She was sixth in Chicago that year. I think the time is right for her to move to majors. And you look at this field, I don't, she is getting in a little late due to to, to her visa. She was not at the press conference today, I believe. But apart from that, I think she is going to do very well. She's my pick for the win. Yeah. She's not getting into one Saturday night. Yeah. The visa thing's pretty interesting. I didn't realize this runners have to get, you don't just get like a travel tourist visa to come here. You have to get a, what's the visa called John? P1 visa so that you can earn money. And some of these visas, if you need a rush visa, it can cost like 4000 bucks once you do all the lawyers and stuff, which is crazy. So, And the, the athletes have to pay this out of their own pocket. The race does not pay for these things. So I wonder how some of these like guys running the road races on the weekends or who are over here for the summer. If they have one of these visas, they're sort of taking money they're not supposed to. It's sort of interesting, but you know, Boston, John Hancock, they do everything above board. So you need a, a P1 visa and they can be expensive or... If, you know, they expire, then you have to renew and this sort of stuff. And it takes months. So you can't just like fly over here last second, but she will be here. And th- this Boston women's field is for the taking. I mean, let's just get that out there. Then they take the U.S. taxes out, right? When they overseas, they don't take out the taxes, which seems. Yeah, they're expected to pay U.S. taxes on the money. Robert DeGuffa, she's two minutes faster than everyone, but she's never run a marathon like this. I'm sure it's sort of Larry to pick her. I mean, if a Safa blows up, you know, Edna Kipagat's not that good anymore. Dababa's not that good anymore. Mari Dababa. Sharon Cherup was good probably five years ago. So then you're like, boom, Des Linden. Uh, you know, Maria Megra, she won Toronto. There's some other people, Betsy Sana. You know, then you, you bring more people in contention. But 
as I said to Des, like this thing's for the taking. If I think if Workness Degefa does not, if she's not suited well to this Boston course, you, you know, there's not a current 220 person in this field outside of her. Someone capable of running 220 that opens up things up. I you know I, I think Des will be your first American. I don't know. Usually sell her short. I'm going to go with her. I don't know. I think Jordan's just not quite ready yet, but Jordan's made, she's made him run the marathon. So watch her like win this damn thing and it'll all be a different talk for the winner of the race. I, there's no way I can pick Des, right? I mean, I would say there's 0% chance she won last year. She doesn't have the talent to win this thing, but this field, I don't know when I break it down person by person, I'm just, Oh, I think she has the talent to win this thing when it's a 222 type race, you know, when, the, when, the, when there's sub 220 people, I mean, she got, she almost won it. What? 2011, yeah. She came two seconds away. I feel more confident about her chances this year than I did last year. Oh, for honest. sure. Last year was stacked. I mean, yeah. I don't remember. No, we ha you had all, you had top Americans. You had Shalane Flanagan, Molly Huddle. Hasey was entered. She ended up running. And Lyndon, you know, people would have picked, people could have picked Lyndon as the fourth American in that race. She ended up being the first finisher, period. Yeah, but she was even dropped early on, right? I mean, wasn't she doing poorly? And then yeah, she, she was thinking about dropping out. She took help showing Flanagan go to the bathroom and the rest is history, as they say. I don't know. I have to pick someone to win this damn thing. I can't go with Des, but I can, right? <laughs> Everyone okay. picks Des and that's like, you know, the rooting pick. Um, there's Everyone just no way she wins this thing, but I want to pick her. Oh, what about Mary with Sarah? Hmm. No, she didn't run that well at the New York City half. Are you going to do this well then? Are you going to pick Des? <sighs> just not liking this field. Mary Moser was only 15 seconds ahead of Des at the New York City. She was second. Really? Des, Des is looking stronger. Can I take back my Kip Diego pick and pick Des as top American? Yes, you can. Des London top American. I'm going to go. Oh, gosh. No, she falls apart. Hurry up, Walt. You're going to miss your train. And then after you pick your women's, please pick your men's pick as well. I can't pick John's pick, though. There aren't that many. There's only, to me, it's either Des or Hase for top American. That's it. I'm going double Des. Des for the win. Um, you heard it here first, folks. That's pretty crazy. All right, let, let's switch over to the men. One interesting thing, first of all, we've not mentioned, I don't think we've really mentioned Yuki Kawuchi, sort of the people's champ last year, sort of amazing, coming from behind to win it. You know, he's the guy, uh, I, I just sort of take for granted what Let's Run people know. If you're a podcast listener, you're not on the homepage every day, like shame on you. So wait, everybody pause for a second. Go to your podcast player, hit subscribe right now. Thank you very much. Rate and review as well. Five star rate and rating, review. Please. Come on, spread the word. But also, somehow, if you're a podcast listener and you're not a, like a homepage visitor, like that's what you need to be doing. I had TV people, John, coming up to us today saying thank you, thank you very much. We love the previews. They'll name anonymous, but you really don't find better previews than what we have. I'm not trying to toot my own horn. I'm tooting John's horn because he does the vast majority of work with those things. So thank you, John. But Oh, the men's race. So Yuki, we're talking to Brett Larner, Yuki Kawuchi's agent and publisher of Japan running Blogspot. And it was pretty interesting because we everyone just sort of assumed, or at least I'd assumed, that Yuki Kawuchi, he's the people's marathoner. He runs about 20 marathons a year, 12 marathons a year, whatever it is, races all over the world. He wins the damn Boston Marathon last year. And then announces he's going to turn pro. He had a full-time job working in, for the government in a school and announces well, with that job, he could not take appearance fees or sponsorships. He could take prize money and bonuses. That was it. Tell him about the shoes, how he would Yeah, win. so yeah. he announced afterwards he didn't go pro for Boston this year. So he's been pro since April 1st. We just, I just assumed he was cashing in on the money. And Brett's like, no. He has a five-year contract in Britain, excuse me, in Japan with his school. Government contracts are five years. His second five-year contract was ending this year. And currently he works the one to nine shift at 1 p.m. to 9 a.m. 1 p.m. to 9 p.m. His shift was going to switch from 9 p.m., excuse me, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. And he's like, it'd be much harder for him to train because now he trains in the morning primarily. So he's like, regardless, a couple years ago, he started thinking, he's like, hey, I always want to try to be a full-time runner when this contract's up. And it worked out perfectly for the guy. He wins Boston. Now he can get a sponsorship. So he's sponsored by ASICS. He's got a couple other sponsors. But the cool thing is, we're like, well, before like, he worked with ASICS, right? And Brett's like, he wasn't allowed as a government employee to take free stuff. We're like, what? He paid his own shoes, bought his own training shoes. And then for racing shoes, um, it's even more interesting. He would borrow them from ASICS. 
So A6 would give him a special shoe or something for the race. He would wear it and then return it back to them. But I guess with training shoes, you know, you can't argue, I guess, that you're returning a shoe that's, you know, got 500, 500 miles, miles in on, it. Yeah. So the, that's a pretty cool story I thought about uh, Yuki. So Yuki's in the field. With of, that said, none of us are picking yeah, him to win. Yeah, we're not picking him to win. Okay, I pr- we promised Scott Fabo audio. Let me get that here. Stalling, here we go. All right, Scott Fabo. We'll have men's winner and first American, but here's Scott Fabo first talking about his chances. Uh, you know, I'd love to be top five. I really think I'm, I'm fit enough to if, uh, if I have a good day, but... Um, you know, the goal is the same as any race. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to try as hard as I can try and do the best that I can do. And if that ends up being outside the top five, so be it. I think I'm capable of it, physically capable of being of being top five. Do you worry about the weather much? No, man, I don't care. I don't care what the weather is. Good, kind of good. So that's Fobble. That's the attitude a lot of people have. They don't care about the weather. It's Boston, right? If you're not ready to run Boston, any weather conditions, you're not ready. Actually, speaking of that, did I mention what did I mention on air, Robert? What uh, Jeffrey Eggleston said? No. So Eggleston, what, like four years ago, ran two ten fifty. I don't know how many years ago. It might have been more. Twenty fourteen. He did it in Gold Coast, Australia. He ran two ten fifty something in the marathon, and I was like, "Hey, you know, you, you haven't done that much since then. Uh, what's been going on?" And he's like, "It's mainly the opportunity of getting in the right race." Um, so I think that that same year he ran two eleven in Boston. He's like, look, I came back in Boston fitter the next year and ran like, I think, three or four minutes slower. He's like, just the weather wasn't conducive. So now with calls for a 15-mile-an-hour tailwind, this could be, as I told Shadrach, we'll play that audio at the end of him and Jerry talking about it. I'm like, hey, man, 208 weather for you. So It's about time. If there's a tailwind, the Americans, Americans have need no to take excuses. Advantage of it. need to go sub-210. You've got the guys who theoretically should be able to do it, and Shadrach, Jared Ward, Scott Fulbold. I'm not convinced it's, it's going to be a tailwind. Could be more- the weather could still be terrible. You know, Jared said the weather could 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 change. Please make your picks, Bolden. My picks. Gosh, so first American and overall winner. Somebody else go first. Well, I I know who I'm picking. I'm going number one American, Jared Ward. He's finally healthy. He hey, he was kind of injured in 2016, even when he made the Olympic truck team and then got sixth to the Olympics. 2017, totally hurt. Last year. Six weeks out from New York, he was thinking about quitting. He was thinking about dropping out of that race, withdrawing from that race because not of, quitting the sport. Correct, Dro- withdrawing from the race um, because of a hamstring injury. David Monty convinced him to give it a go. He gave it a go. He was the top American. Beat Scott Fallible by four seconds in that race, ran two twelve. From everything I've heard, his training has been going even better this time around. He has had no interruptions. He feels like he's ready to do- go, whatever the weather. I- I am picking Jared Ward as a top American. And for the overall win, I I wrote that article ranking them from 16 to 1. So I'm going to go with my number one pick, Luisa DeCisa. I think Jeffrey Karui could easily win this race. He's good enough. You, you're first and second in the last two years. He'll handle whatever kind of weather's thrown at him. But DeCisa, he ran, just, he ran 205 in New York last year, guys. That's freaking incredible. And he's won Boston twice. He's. This is exactly his kind of marathon. And if he's saying it to Weldon that he's fitter than he was before his previous Boston wins, before New York, he's my pick for the win, Lisa DeCisa. Yeah, I think for me, I want to see Karui win. I would like to see him get back going again. But logic tells me that DeCisa is going to win it. A few things. I mean, I probably shouldn't read into like a couple sentences a guy says, but Crew is like, oh, the focus this year is world championships. I'm like, oh, okay. You're not ready for this one. Lawrence Toronto, some of these other guys. I just want a great race. And I think a lot of times you get that in Boston with the Hills. There's just so, even last year, somebody gets ahead. There's still some intrigue that they might blow up. First American. We could, no one ever picked Shadrach, right? So I think Jared Ward's the fittest, ready to go. He's got the highest pedigree. I don't know how, I mean, how does he, how does he do in Boston though? It's not, I mean, Scott Fobble, he discovered a new area in Flagstaff to rain out by Sunset Crater. He's really ready for this course, so I wouldn't be shocked if he's the first. But like, he's still a pedigree. I don't know. Even if you want to put Ritz a, a category ahead of Jared at their best, I mean, it's hard to argue with a guy who's six at the Olympics. But notch down to Jared, even and then, but definitely still a notch down to Scott. 
I mean, he's one of best America's best marathoners, but I'm still going to go with Jared. You know, it's like horse racing. They have all the speed ratings and they have like the class thing. And they say, always pick on class until okay. somebody shows up at the next class. Time for my pick. That was the most long drawn out pick I've ever heard. Well, did Curry say he was in shape or not? Yes. Okay, Curry is my pick there. I, I, I like him. I root for him. We haven't had our our Bash Alberto segment yet, so oh, we got to get that in. I got about five minutes. But I, I rooted for Karui to, to take down Rupp that one year, and he did it for me. So shout out to him. But top American guys, you are disrespecting him, Dathan Ritzenheim. He's a 1256 guy. He's got a, a bronze medal at the World Half Marathon. When you're talking about pedigree, he is the. When did he? That's ten years ago, Robert. Hey, hey, hey! What, what are we coming up on, John? We're coming up on. Next week is the five year anniversary of the most read article in let's run.com. I mean, we're article in let's run.com history, and also the five year article anniversary of Meb Kofleski's win. Meb was very old, he hadn't done much in recent years, and he won Boston. So, Ritz was in 2015 when only time Ritz has finished Boston, maybe the only time he's run it, he was seventh. Doesn't sound impressive, but he was only two minutes and three seconds behind. Well, at least I had He was the top American. He was in 61 minutes shape 10 weeks ago. He's made for this course. He's a cross country runner. This is a guy that won world junior. I mean, won a medal at world juniors and cross former NCAA champion in cross country. Hills are not going to be a problem for him. Dathan Ritzenheim, fountain of youth, top American. One thing we have not talked about guys, we had almost the death of the sport. And I need to get this on the podcast. People have probably been waiting all day for this. A guy, Who's coached by Patrick saying the same coach as Ellie Kipchoge has tested has been busted by biological passport, Cyrus Ruto. I think he's like a 1303 guy. John, you spoke to his agents. What's the story? Does Kipchoge train with this guy? Please tell me no. Is there any connection between him and Kipchoge other than having the same coach? No. He is represented by Michelle Boating, who is runs one for one sports. Kipchoge is represented by Global Sports Communications, which is Valentine Trow and Yoss Herman's group. They live in, they both are based in Captagat, but both things guys and the global group live in different training camps. They do train together, the two groups, but Ruto is a part of the track group and Kipchoge is part of the marathon group. So they really don't do any workouts together from what Michelle told me. And he said that, Michelle also said that he was surprised when he heard about this. He'd never heard anything he had never had any suspicions about Cyrus and he d- says that Cyrus is saying he's innocent. They're trying to figure out the next steps to take. They are going to try to fight the case. They need to hire a lawyer because they've got to fight against the the facts are right now that his app- ABP scores were suspicious enough for them to sanction yeah. him. So he's been provisionally suspended, but they're going to try to fight it. Yeah. So an ABP positive for those who don't know, it's not like, he tested positive for some drug named ABP. ABP's biological passport, athlete biological passport, and just means essentially his blood values are so off the charts they're like, this can't be done naturally. We're charging you with doping. So Michelle's saying, look, I have no reason to do this. We're going to try to fight it. It'd be interesting to really see what happens. I think it's good, you know, that he's, you know, that he at least spoke to you. I, I mean, I guess the guy could obviously be doping, right? But they're not trying to hide anything or go quiet and uh, oh I can't speak like no he made it clear he didn't want to reveal every piece of information he has right now he's he did you know he spoke to me for 15 minutes we'll have an article coming for for it on the website soon but he also said when this is over we're willing to come out with every piece of information we want to be as transparent as possible because again he said look we're innocent sorry says he's innocent I believe him we don't have anything to hide that's why he talked to me and that's why he said they'll try to come out with all evidence that they can find when the time is right. And it's interesting, guys. I mean, for people who don't follow the sport closely, I mean, he's, I don't even know how Cyrus, someone like Cyrus Ruto makes a living running. He's a 1303 guy, but that's, he's done that once. I think he's broken 1310 once in his life. Um, you know, it, it's a hard way to make money on, on the Golden League circuit. I mean, he was fourth in Shanghai, the Diamond League opener last year in 1310, but didn't run faster all season. He was 1328 in Brussels. So, you know, he's not exactly a giant in Kenyan running at this point at 26 years of age. We'll have more on that. We'll have more on all of this, Robert, on the website. My train leaves in nine minutes, and I'm still doing this podcast. 
so everybody real quick anyone listening i will play some audio we'll have the jared audio the desi audio if you guys want to listen to that oh ryan hall actually about how to get buff that's my most important interview i might put that on the podcast but if not all the other interviews will be on the website please check the website please subscribe robert we'll let you sign off for everybody guys should be a great monday i'm excited my child care comes back into town so i will be full time back into running on monday can't wait for boston my, i love to watch it during the work, work day so everyone enjoy the race have fun hopefully Nathan Ridsenheim is your top American to prove me right yet again.